if you are watching this. <laughs> if you close this gap and close this circle, it's going to lead to thousands of, or if, if not millions, lives being saved. And because they invested some money into your company, they might have an ulterior motive. No matter how much money you get, like even could be millions, it might not be the right thing. The thing about software engineering, it's like, it depends to trademark. Okay, Krzysztof, finally you're here. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, so let's get straight into the main question. So, yeah, who are you? What are you doing? And Yeah, all right, all right. Hi, so my name is Krzysztof Baron. So, uh, yeah, what do I do? Uh, plenty of things. So I am a, a student, so I'm currently doing my master's at the TU Delft or the Delft University of Technology. So I'm doing my master's in computer science. But my specialization is software engineering. At least that's what it says on paper, but I've done a lot of courses when it comes to machine learning. So I know a thing or two and I like to play around with uh, uh, LLMs and like any or LLMs or like co computer vision. So I'm, uh, I, quite, I quite like to quite like the world of AI and like machine learning and deep learning. So play around with that. And also at the same time, I am right now a working for a startup that's also located in Delft. Uh, it's called Oasis Now, and we are a health tech a health tech startup. And uh, our office is actually in the, in the incubator called Yes Delft, which is like kind of like a small little incubator that, together with some accelerators, that helps to boost up your startup. It, it's uh, it's like also has a building where you can actually rent out like your little offices and sort of like a container rooms which is quite nice and you, you can you you are f you are free to like do whatever you want inside with it almost everything so have a little office there so that's nice and yeah that that's it uh, yeah that's, that's cool that's super cool to have like some place to gather and you know brainstorm some ideas uh, and to work but yeah but uh, w what is oasis now what's what's your mission and what do you do there yeah so uh, actually we are doing a lot uh, but I'm gonna try to summarize it into like three uh, into qu in a few in few sentences so um, we're basically a dynamic health tech startup that has the mission to basically help revolutionize precision and personalized medicine research uh, so in order to do this, there are like many challenges that we want to tackle. So first of all, we want to provide the uh, ownership of medical data. So as you may know, like uh, here at least in the Netherlands, it's kind of like tricky whenever you want to get your own health documents. Like let's say you want to go to your uh, house arts or like you're basically for people at home there, uh, this is your um, like home doctor or like... If, your GP, your general practitioner, your personal GP that you are assigned one. And usually it's quite difficult for you to get any data, like any documents. It's usually hidden within the system there and it's like shared usually through um, other systems like Chipsoft or, or Epic that they store that data and it never leaves premises, but also you don't really get any sort of ownership, almost no ownership of it. Uh, so we would like to basically help to provide that. There is also the fact that there are a lot of people in the Netherlands, but also all over the world, that have rare diseases, and the, uh, uh, rare diseases. And the thing is, is that like whenever you're in such a situation, it's difficult to get help because your GP will probably not help you to get to the right specialist. It's a lot of effort, but also from the side of the hospitals, it's very difficult to recruit and test uh, to recruit those people for like any testing or any try or any trials or to get even that specialist so we would like to prov uh, we are trying to provide that basically that bridge between the hospitals or like the clinics to patients whether you are healthy or have a rare disease or any sort of dis disease um, but also we would like to liberate the so-called data silo so let's say that there are like a lot of universities that are doing any biomedical research uh, we the the problem is that like once one lab has this data it usually becomes very tricky to share it because there are a lot of procedures and but even within internally within labs uh, so we learned that actually through uh talking to many universities and medical uh, centers that uh, even within their labs they cannot really share their own uh, share the data because it's like you it's basically like drawing up a new study because you would have to then get a uh uh, what you called uh, what you call it uh, permission uh, uh, permission from those uh, patients that you collected the data from again 
and uh, it's like a headache, it's, pa it's all paperwork and headache, and we would like to alleviate that, which ties us, ties us nicely to the uh, data ownership. So basically the person that owns that data would, would have a bit an ability to say yes or no if they would like their data shared across another institution or another lab, let's say, or something like that, which basically if you close this gap and close the circle, it's going to lead to usually faster drug discoveries, uh, uh, qu quicker development and thousands of, or if, if not millions, lives being saved uh, if you help those medical researchers, but also if like uh, patients that like have ownership of the data that they can share, because the idea kind of came from the fact that, let's say you arrive in a new country, right? Uh, like you're from Lithuania, right? Yeah. So let's say you arrive this du to this Dutch system and like you're completely new to it and let's say you have a specific uh, disease, right? Or like some something that's uh, um, like, like, like something very specific. And it, it, with, within the Netherlands, for example, you have to first go to the GP, they would have to diagnose you and give it to a specialist. They won't really tell you like, go ahead. Like they won't really, sometimes that you might be blocked already at that stage that like, oh, we don't know, we would have to test you, or they might say, oh, I'm not going to send you, it's going to cost us too much money. So what usually happens is, so with this like sort of ownership of data, you'll be able to just be, give permission for those GPs to access those documents and share it in a unified sort of protocol uh, that could be cross-border, but also safe, like safe, because like you will have the say whether somebody can view your documents and things like that. And uh, on the other side, we, like let's say you are at the pipeline stage that like, oh, you would like to recruit some patients for a trial. You would like to have that automated step because right now it's a very manual process. Uh, like it's usually somebody writing up some criteria and then like looking individually for each patient. And we would like to help that. So we are trying to do a lot of stuff. Uh, I tried my best, but this is like essentially what we do at Oasis now. Okay, but but yeah, it's super cool mission, Thank I believe. You. And yeah, uh, how how did you like think of joining this team? And yeah, what was your process, yeah. thinking process? Yeah. So uh, one thing to point out first is that I am actually not a founder. So I am like one of one of the first engineers that joined the company. Um, one of the first, whenever we got like the funding and like we also published our prov like published our first version of our app, which is uh, right now available online. Um, so, like the reason why I joined the team was that I was I had a lot of experience before that in uh, large tech uh, tech companies uh, where, um, or basically the scope was very defined and also like. I got, I got a lot of experience in that, like uh, how to work in those teams and those organizations. But I felt that like I wanted to, like I had a bit of a feeling that I wanted to work on something that would be from like the bootstrap or from boot, uh, like pick myself from the bootstraps and like from s build something from scratch, right? That, that's something that, that like uh, I wanted, which is basically one of the ways or like uh, one of the ways and like sort of like the right of path is usually through a startup because you're literally building up the grant, grant work and building something from scratch. You don't get that as much in like large organizations and plus on top of that, the founders, uh, I was really convinced by the founders to join the team. So the founders are Sarah uh, and Nima, uh, Nima being the CEO and Sarah being the CTO. So when I first talked to them, they told me about the problem that they were trying to solve. And it sort of like stri uh, stroked my interest in, in a way that I just felt, OK, I have to join the, that team. And uh, so here am I, here am I um, exactly now, almost uh, one, and, uh, one and a half year, actually, already now. So I joined in 2022 in October. So yeah, almost one and a half year. So. Okay, and uh, having been there like for one and a half years, are you satisfied and are you happy with what you get to accomplish? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very happy with the. So I'm very happy with what we accomplished. We managed to deploy our first version of the app and actually managed to showcase it to a bunch of uh, organization and sort of like grow our network sort of through it. So uh, we also got our first rounds of uh, pre-seed investments, which was equivalent of, uh, I think, uh, 270,000 uh, euros, yeah. which is a quite a nice amount of money to start off with and wor wor work with. Um, 
So that was uh, very nice to so sort of like know that like, oh, your idea has been validated and somebody would like to put money into it. So yeah. that, 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 is, that, had, that really gives a really nice feeling. But also I'm really proud of like where we came from, like in the fact that like we were in this like maze of uh, scoping the project and trying to find uh, what actually do we need to build to actually get get something like the first version up that that's something that that's a very nice feeling and also being able to deploy it and then say hey i was part of building this it it, it really makes you feel proud yeah. for it talking it, so. also about the investment part could you elaborate a bit on what does it take for a startup to get like funding and what is the path there how, how do you do it uh, so I was so just to clarify, I wasn't yeah. involved in those okay. like uh, stages when it was like when you got like the investment. So I'm not really an expert of it, but uh, from what I could tell, the way that you get investments <laughs> is like for ba it's usually like uh, th there are multiple ways. So there's the one through like VCs, so venture capitalists. So basically, those are like usually firms that have a lot of money that they put of like a bunch of uh, people, uh, people's rich people's money or like uh, yeah. retirement fund, people's retirement funds, where they basically, it's kind of money that, that like then is distributed among, startup, among startups that then try to basically give some return, like return that money and also some pro the profits that they get and then like beyond that and then they uh, give that back essentially. So it's like a way, so for so the, for those organizations, they scout startups and uh, they um, give you some money investments with expectation that you'll give some returns in like down the line, like uh, four to five five years down the line or something, uh, or even longer, sometimes even ten years down the line, that you get return that money plus some prof uh, plus profits and you are co going to continually grow. There are family offices which work very similarly, but it's basically more like. Oh, this is like a smaller firm that like it's they're not really out there. Uh, they kind of try to hide themselves. It's like also th these people they have also money. It's not to say that they don't, but they're usually quite small. They don't want you to. Uh, they, they don't want to be found. They just like if they like your idea, they'll reach out probably to you, um, and uh, they might give you. They might have a talk with you, and then give you a bit of mo money through that. Or there are like some competitions that you might pitching competitions that you might join. Um, and there was like also one big one that uh, I forgot. So yeah, I think that those are like, but those are I would say like the main uh, sources of get, getting any sort of investments. But don't don't quote me on that. I'm not really an expert onto that, and I haven't been involved in uh, pitching to investors and talking to them. It usually takes a lot of effort because you really have to sort of build networks, uh, relationships. You have to reach out to them. Sometimes they reach out to you. But also, uh, one thing that I must say is that not all money is equal. So sometimes you might get an yeah. uh, investor that that uh, is interested in your product, but for the wrong reasons. So they, then because they invested some money into your company, they might have an ulterior motive that like, yeah. oh, that I want you to go in this way. Oh, I have a say in like how your company develops. So, and if you if you don't get there, because like it's also partially, it's like your, it's a partner, it's a partnership. So. If that partnership is not going along well, then no matter how much money you get, like even could be millions, it might not be the right thing. So, and also uh, can d really damage the internal culture as well of the company and things like that. So, uh, but yeah. So I, I guess it, did I answer your question, or yeah, do you want yeah. to get get back to that? Or yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah, super that's cool. But yeah, but let's just a little bit zoom out of yeah. the startup. Uh, you mentioned that you had internships in big tech. So mm -hmm. yeah, so can you tell us more about the, those experiences and yeah, do you have maybe firstly start, do you have any strategies for the like university student that what you want to get in into those big tech? Uh, what path do you have to go to? to mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I, I will, I'll tell that. So I would say that, uh, yeah, how, so just to clarify my, how my career trajectory went uh, was that for now I didn't have like yet any full-time jobs yet, just to clarify. So I had, uh, so it sort of started like I first started a local company called TopDesk, which does like a lot of HR slash uh, ticketing, soft, ticketing software. It's located in Delft, has an office in Delft and uh, in the Netherlands, but also one in Tilburg. 
Um, they're quite big in the Netherlands. Uh, so I start, first started wor working there. Then after the year after, I secured an internship at uh, Amazon, uh, specifically in a team called Primair, which works on basically the drone deliveries, uh, drone delivery side. And my team, the group there that was involved in uh, like uh, delivery drones, uh, spe more specifically in uh, uh, computer vision algorithms uh, for those uh, drones. And then after that, I worked at Google, which was uh, where I was part of the Google Cloud uh, team, uh, which was building a highly specific AI tools that would uh, help with predicting stocks or basically working for uh, or basically helping like uh, companies with large inventories or like uh, retailers to basically get their stock uh, get their uh, stock by, by stock I don't mean like financial stocks it just means stock like uh, freight like just basically the stuff that people buy like for example uh, IKEA like uh, help them like uh, run a lot of predictive stuff uh, predictive algorithms and things like that so I was part of that team uh, so that, that's that let's close that uh, chapter um, so uh, when it comes to strategies um, yeah so there are multiple things so um, Basically, one thing is that I always applied every year when I was trying to trying out for those uh, internships. I always applied to every single opening that there was that was like either local, or I tried like from smaller to medium to large companies. And it's not necessarily that uh, I applied always to the companies that I was only fully interested in. Sometimes there are companies that I was like, okay. They have an interest. They don't really have a necessarily interesting product or specialization that I'm highly interested in. But it could be that my vision is a bit clouded on what they do or what that work involves. So I was just like kind of trying to go into it open-minded, and also on top of that, that helped me to get a lot of interview experience. Like on in a way that like see how companies interview, uh, tech, tech like tech companies interview how. Uh, and then, like, have basically a conversation about uh, about like what what do, what that team does, and yeah, just things like that. So, I, I, I like apply to apply to them and try to get as many interviews as possible because there's always like the performance stress, you know. Like, uh, it's a, it, it feels completely different whenever you are presenting your work or you know what you've done and you have your projects, and then the next another thing is like talking in front of the interviewer about yourself, and it's uh, for a for a job or internship, and it's very, uh, very stressful in in, uh, in those instances. So, practice always helps. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, maybe I want to ask you yeah, for sure. It's it's super stressful during the interviews. Do you have like some story from the interview, like uh, I don't know, maybe s some funny story that you, you, you I don't know you messed up something and <laughs> the bigger or uh, maybe the the like HR. I think I had like a, I can tell you a, like one story about the HR hiccup that was quite interesting and quite relevant uh, regarding COVID time. And then there was like one which was, um, um, one which was like my uh, screw up that was uh, something related to the interview that I did. And I, I still find it funny to this day, but uh, at the same time, it was very painful, but yeah. So um, I'll tell you first the HR uh, screw up. So the first one was basically I was applying to for internship in a tech in a for a tech position that was for an airline company. Let's leave uh, that. Uh, <laughs> 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 Just uh, keep them anonymous, and it's not their, their fault fault of theirs. Um, it kind of like happened because like so. So basically, what happened was that I was interviewing for the position of like a software developer for a project for an uh, airline uh, that I would work in and I was it was a pretty nice interview um, wasn't too technical as well I did uh, slightly technical but uh, it was had a nice chat and everything and then they called me back and they said you know what we would like to you to work on this team and like you seem it would be nice this was my fir very first time that I wanted to get an internship and then you know what happens COVID-19 lockdown and everybody has to work from home. And you know how like uh, the airline industry was like kind of almost halted. Yeah, basically a lot of airlines uh, had to cut down on like their spendings and like really go into like uh, uh, into a sta state of saving, mo into state of really saving money. And 
yeah, also asking money from the government because uh, they didn't have reserve funds. Uh, but that's a different story. So that was uh, more of like a funny thing that, uh, yeah, they, then they later told me, hey, we had to withdraw your offer. Like we currently are not hiring anybody on the team. So it was like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, th this was like also, it was also quite uh, quite sad because this was the first like official offer that I got from the company and then I, they had to withdraw that. So that was a bit sad, but feels yeah, you know, it feels bad because I worked yeah. really hard because I applied everywhere. I was always at the last stage of the interview and once I got it, you don't really get the. But the, then that later on, they had the top desk started hiring themselves and the and then I tried uh, tried for that position. I put a lot of effort into it, and uh, I was lucky enough to get hired by them. And it was like partially remote, so it was it was nice as well. It was also during the COVID time, so the beginning. So that was that was at that time when everything was closed down. People, there wasn't any vaccine on the horizon yet. It was like very very scary time at that time. So. Yeah. And also the whole thing about the scary, being scared about the economy. Okay, but uh, I'm talking about too many details. So um, another screw up that I personally had was actually um, not being able to, it's kind of a meme, but like reverse the linked list iteratively and, uh, and recursively. So that was a thing that I had to... Um, um, perform like the, in front of an interview, like it was an interview for a, actually a tech company. It was like, actually the same year that I was interviewing that I screwed it up in the last stage. And uh, I was asked the most simple question about like reversing a linked list. And I just couldn't do it. The interviewer was hint sh throwing at me hints. Then like I was constantly giving them like a big O of n solution. It was like no, uh, sorry, big uh, big O of n squared, and it was like no, you can do it in like a big O of n. And yeah, it was very. Uh, I, I felt really humbled then, but I remember that was like the because that interview consisted of of three interviews, and that was one of them. Other ones went fine, but because I bombed that one so much, I knew that the rejection was was in, in, imminent, and. Uh, Week later, I just uh, they said no, but I but I remember that it was like the most painful rejection that I ever received when it comes to like from come like uh, for an interview for an internship. But yeah, like with those, you learn new stuff exactly, and you humble yourself and yeah. So and you yeah. get up and go exactly elsewhere and try again. Yeah, yeah, it's like a kind yeah, of like a, if you if you like to think about it, it's kind of like a grind, <laughs> so to say, if you. Yeah, so just trial and a lot of trial and error and also interviewing practice because like it, yeah it's just like you it's difficult to even simulate it it's like yeah. because nothing is on the line if it's a simulated environment you cannot really because there are no stakes in like such an environment and like you can pretend but but uh, at least for me that was, I had a uh, trouble in like those simulated environments like it, I just saw that there was a high disconnect between like simulated interviews and like actual interviews so yeah, and uh, since you did a lot of those internships, what are the main benefits of doing them? Like, after all, you're spending probably your whole summer working, <laughs> right? So what do you gain from them? Uh, yeah, experience, experience. <laughs> sure. and money. Uh, oh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of course. yeah, of course, uh, the m most important thing, like, uh, uh, no, but uh, experience, I would say. So the thing is that you get to, like, um, like, you get so uh, like a uh, experience and write actually like company uh, quality code basically yeah. like uh, a lot of companies have their own standards on how you build it usually uh, how you build something there are like procedures like there are reviews you get like actual feedback from your mentors or like other developers and then you get to improve them you learn about like the procedures that yeah. those companies have and you start to like change a bit your minds uh, your mindset because like I know that like whenever you are working at a university, your projects are usually like kind of like oh just uh, a super glue, super glue yeah. after super glue, <laughs> and uh, just like uh, stick these pieces <laughs> together, and there's like no, sometimes not really much thought to put into your projects, uh, not all the time, but sometimes whenever you are like on a deadline, it's like it's a completely different mentality on how you code and like what sort of main style you would like to keep. Uh, you also get to learn about. Um, yeah, just like a uh, real world environment. Like you get to learn like, okay, how 
to uh, deploy your code, how to like make sure that it's up to standards. You also get to review yeah. somebody's code mm -hmm. as well because somebody posts their PR or like pull request and uh, or MR uh, if you're using GitLab. <laughs> uh, and then, like, you get to review it, uh, review it, and then, like, say, "Oh, you, you forgot this dot." Like, n like you get oh. to nitpick sometimes, but or, or you get to like actually ask a genuine question, like, "Oh, is, wouldn't it be easier to import this rather than this?" Or you get those, um, uh, yeah, you get into those uh, things, and then also you get into uh, like uh, you also kind of become quite resourceful because sometimes whenever you work at these companies. Internet might not be your friend. Like uh, Stack Overflow might not be your friend because, really? like, you know, there are a lot of internal tools, internal like libraries that yeah. might not be very well documented, or you kind of have to like learn how to deal with that and also use with use what you have, and you kind of become like quite resourceful with it. Like, yeah, like uh, from my experience, I, I, I would guess it, it 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 tries to help you like to be a more rounded engineer. I mean, it also depends like what task uh, you get for your internship because sometimes there are like projects that like you are hired and then like you're thrown away and it's like yeah. on the side and it's like do something in the background and then like, okay, there might be a little bit less value. But like the one that they, there is like some value to it is like if you're put into a team and you kind of have like a big task that's relevant to your team yeah. that you're working towards and you get mentorship as well, co-reviews, co but also they might be like, okay, could you please uh, make some contributions to uh, this project as well? Pick up like a ticket, uh, and then maybe work on something like that. So that's you get like a, that experience which you don't really get at the university. And I think that a lot of employers, if you once you finish your study, value that. And it's like a experience that that you might not get through university. Yeah, and uh, like if oh, we well, were like to compare like uh, working. Uh, a student job, for example, at a small local company and an internship at a multinational like Google. Mm, what, which one is better? <laughs> or, like, <laughs> <laughs> Oof, that's a, <laughs> it's a cracker of a question. Um, yeah, none of, none of them are better. It's like, uh, yeah, like you could also depends, get really right. bad internship okay. at uh, Fang or like those big companies yeah. as well. It just really depends on like, there are a lot of things that really depend on like your team the project that you're gonna work on, uh, but also like any like a lot of work experience is valuable, but also you kind of has to be um, intentional. So like if you want to yeah. develop yourself, for example, within a company as a student and work on something that you actually enjoy and work on the side, then uh, it might be like that might be more worthwhile than going to a large company sometimes. So, I mean, of course, the large companies, the one thing that you get is you start to think in terms of scale, you start to think about like, okay, um, how will this product be used? How, like uh, how to make it usable, how to deploy it, and like what what's actually happening behind the scenes. And uh, you have like a lot of these processes that you learn, like to defend your software against like bugs and uh, things like that. And you learn about like a lot of, Internal tools and processes that, like, I'm, I'm repeating myself, sorry, but you just learn a bunch of those stuff that you might not get at, like, uh, smaller local yeah. companies, which I guess, I guess that's what you would get at, the, at the, like, the larger companies. But also, I think it's just, like, one thing that you might be missing as well at, like, smaller companies is... No, actually, the, you get it everywhere, but I wanted to say, like, smart people, but, like, it's, there are always smart people everywhere, like, even the smaller local companies. Like, there are smart people that are working there, like, uh, uh, but one thing is that, like, um, a lot of the engineers that are hired within FANG, they're, like, they're usually pre-vetted, and that usually means that there's, like, quite well-rounded and very good engineers, Um and you get to work with them, get feedback from the uh, get like feedback from them, yeah. which is something that's uh, quite quite valuable, I would say. Uh, I mean, I don't want to generalize it, but sometimes at smaller companies you might, but depends like also on per company culture. And I'm not generalizing it to everybody, but sometimes like I fire some students. What tends to happen is that they get assigned a ticket, finish it, but you might not get experience into like oh 
trying to refactor your system or something like that, or trying to change something internally, it'll probably be something, oh, do something small that like a, a junior engineer could do, but like yeah. at the small cost and just like, oh, do these tickets and like, you'll be fine. And okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but talking maybe about the whole, the, the software engineer position, mm -hmm. uh, not, not about yeah, comparing the companies, big, small, but what do you like the most about being software engineer? <laughs> Oh, I like uh, really a lot of things about it. So uh, I guess like the fact that you can just simply, well, code, <laughs> that's an enjoyable thing, I would say. Just like the idea that like something, some text that you have can actually execute some uh, execute something and do something useful in your computer, that, that that's already something that, that that's pretty cool. I guess I like the fact that... Uh, it's it's a very malleable endeavor. Like in a sense, it's like you can make it into engineer into engineering as well. That like you really think of it like on a system system level and like you design it you, and things like that. But also at the same time, you can pretty quickly change stuff. It's pretty malleable. You can write you can write automated tests to like uh, see if it see if it works and uh, yeah you can get. Um, and yeah, there's always something that's always new out there that somebody has built, like new packages, new frameworks. Uh, but also, like there, there's a lot of things that you can build yourself as well from scratch. Uh, there's like a lot to learn as well, so it's a, like a field that you're constantly learning. And that's one thing that I quite really like is that, um, in some sense, it's quite malleable. That like you learn about something, you can learn you can learn completely something new the next day as well. Like not not on that like oh, in a day that you learn something, but like you can simply pick it up. Play, if you if you enjoy something, like play with it, and then also own your local machine, and then like try to test it out. Um, which I'm doing that to my, uh, myself. I like to, for example, test out um, new technologies on my machine. Like download that and um, play around with it, see how it works, and. Uh, yeah, it's like that. That's the enjoyable part. Enjoyable part. Writing tests is more painful, I would say, because like then you are really questioning, like, okay, is it supposed to work like that? But also, it's nice to, I guess, like build build something and like prototype. I really like the aspect of yeah. prototype, like being able to quickly prototype as well and qu rather quickly uh, verify your idea when it comes to like, uh, oh. When it comes to like your product, but also like within how how it works. At what age did you realize that you were going to become a software engineer? To be honest, I didn't really realize it uh, at any stage. Like I felt that it was kind of like a, one of the options that was given to me. Like um, so, before I started uh, university at computer science, I. Remember that I liked working with computers. Uh, like, um, so for my background, uh, for my background, my uh, dad is actually like uh, he's more of an ICT person. Like he works with networks, um, and uh, he really enjoys that. Um, and kind of like he, from time to time, has shown something to me on a computer, and I was like, kind of like amazed that like, oh, you can do that. Oh, that's that's quite interesting. But uh, it, I never got like a uh, sort of too much interest into like his specialization. I was just kind of like, oh, it's cool that you can do something with your computer. I wonder if that you can like be have something creative. Oh, that's what I was looking for. Like we're creative. It's also quite a creative endeavor, but it's like a nice mix between like being artsy and en art and engineering. Yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, kind of like when I bef once I started the, at the university, I started to I was like, oh, I like it. It's a really nice feeling that like after figuring out something or thinking about it and then writing it and like pressing run or like typing into your terminal uh, the command and it works and runs. That's a really nice feeling, honestly. It's just like, uh, yeah, it's very rewarding. Although, you know, there's a lot of like swearing involved before <laughs> yeah, when the, the code crashes, when bugs you write tests. Yeah, or when you write <laughs> tests. <laughs> exactly. Because you always write them after you already have written some code. Unless if you're using TDD, but then again, sometimes you don't know yeah. what the tests you are going to run because you don't know how it works. So, yeah. It's like a very open-ended question. It's like literally the whole, also the whole industry and the whole uh, thing about software engineering. It's like 
it depends trademark <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like yeah everything is like it depends and like you're you it can be like really useful um um so, sometimes like you really have to like evaluate your decisions and think about them and yeah but you can also go with it and just like try try stuff out see if it works uh but yeah yeah yeah. Uh, on your LinkedIn, it says you have experience with Y Combinator, right? Uh, why, why Combinator? Are you sure? <laughs> no, um, right. Um, I mean, uh, I, can <laughs> I mean, that's uh, it's fine. Um, so basically, the um, so our startup, uh, we actually applied to Y Combinator, yeah. uh, which is like a big accelerator in America, in uh, America for startups. It, it like. Uh, it invests into startups and gives you like this like access to the pool yeah. of like uh, other startups of like working with like uh, ex co-founders of like for example Twitch, Uber, yeah. OpenAI. There are a lot of like uh, co like co-founders that you might get as mentors and like they might help you out with like your startup, but also you get immense network in Silicon Valley with uh, like. Uh, uh, of investors as well and and and, and ex startup founders or startup founder uh, current startup founders which is really nice a lot of mentorship uh, and uh, you get to work in like um in California in uh, the bay area in uh, in silicon valley uh, so you get that like you know yeah. that li the tech lifestyle there <laughs> but uh what's nice about it i'm get uh, um yeah so you get like a, a lot of those benefits um and yeah, you get like to work with next to like really ambitious and like a place where sort of like a lot of stuff that we use day to day in tech is developed. Okay. And yeah, so we applied the, applied to okay. it and we got into the interview, one of the la last interview stages. However, yeah. we didn't go through. I wasn't part of the interview, um, like the co-founders, uh, Nima, Sarah uh, and uh, Nima and Sarah were, did it and um Oh yeah, there's also another co-founder called Victor, but uh, that, but he recently left left the startup. He was uh, also one of the third co-founder. But uh, anyways, um, so we uh, so basically consisted of like 15 minute interview with like the uh, y YC. Um, uh, what, what, like you, you know that 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 YC has like their uh, YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah. And like you basically one of those people that performed there, like Michael. Um, I forgot. Uh, I always forget their names. Like Mike. Like for example, Michael. Yeah. Um, like. You can get interviewed by them, and they like. And you have 15 minutes with them to describe, pitch your startup, and they ask you very specific stuff. But they are like really consistent about like getting your metrics down. So like you okay. need to know how many users are signing up on your platform. What's the retention rate? What's your burn rate? And like all these things, you have to know that beforehand. They are really like specific on those details. And, and it's a very short interview, it's like 15, but they were like, but I understand why they interview like, what, thousand startups. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, unfortunately we didn't get in. Uh, I think like we were on the last stage, which consists of, I think, 800 startups in the last. So they, I think, last. Uh, so we tried to apply for the Y Combinator Winter Batch 2024. And we didn't get in, sad sadly. But they gave us some nice feedback. Uh, I'm not going to share it what feedback they <laughs> yeah, gave us. But yeah. they uh, told it was quite useful for them. And it's we really always appreciate It's very nice that they do that even though that they have so many applicants and like and also once if you don't get in you can always like apply the next year and try try out yeah. it's it's not that like if you don't get in it's like you're on like a blacklist that never <laughs> but because they, they they tend to invest into companies that are from like all over the um uh spectrum so like the super early startups to like have already like started already like after the pre-seed round like uh, like us oasis yeah. now but also there are like startups that uh, already de uh, like they have already cash flow in but they would like to expand their business and scale but and uh, they pitch that idea there so there are a bunch of startups like that and uh, yeah so yeah that, that that's that's nice but there are also many other accelerators but this is one of the biggest accelerators there are like many others like there are also a couple of them in the Netherlands that uh, we always apply to them because it's always nice to get like you know in contact with the network of our startups, uh, also our startup founders and also investors. So sort of like yeah. 
to build up your relationships and uh, yeah. Oh, and we recently got into an um, NVIDIA Inception program as yes, well. So oh. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. So this was like a program that uh, helps, uh, where NVIDIA helps out with like uh, compute and uh, with yeah. like sc of, uh, uh, resources for you to learn about deep learning as well. And like, um, yeah, also the compute, which is very important if you are working with AI and uh, yeah, uh, and also you get access to like uh, personal network. Also, you get uh, mentioned by Nvidia as well, uh, which brings in like you know a bit of reputation, uh, but also um, yeah, and like a connection to potential investors as well. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Like you said, the last round and the high interviews are fifteen minutes. That's crazy. Yeah, it, yeah, it is how really crazy. many startups are applying there. Yeah, there are a lot of startups, and imagine like all of them being from all over yeah. the world as well. It's not only US. It's like yeah, people that have like, yeah. But uh, also, that it's a myth that like you have to be from US to get in. Okay. Like so there are startups. Actually, we have like a fellow startup at yes at uh, our incubator yes Delft that got got there called Momo Mono or Mono um, or Momo or Mono Medical. Yeah. Uh, they're also a meta company, but they do stuff more with like uh, patient bed um, um, predictions and like also uh, allocating resources within hospital sort of startup. They also did the Y Combinator, although they did it uh, as far as I remember remotely, so they weren't there. Like they kind of like took the courses and like did the pitching, pitching and everything, but like from the Netherlands because that was also they did that while there was like lockdown and covid as well so but that's pretty nice that those things like went on even though like there were like the you know the world was on fire <laughs> so yeah. to say yeah. uh, i also wanted to talk a bit about this thing of competition basically so for example for y combinator like thousands of startups apply there right or mm -hmm. even in your case uh, not even but just in your case like for Google or Amazon internships, thousands of software engineering students apply to those. How do you, like, what would be your advice to like anybody who uh, like knows that there is this competition mm -hmm. and how do you get past like through that? W what steps to take? And I think the, for me, this, uh, this is what I feel often is that when there is a lot of competition, it's like, harder to be confident and to to like uh, present yourself mm. in the best way that maybe you would be able to present without that insane competition so uh, there are like uh, yeah it's a it's a very valid question and indeed uh, uh, indeed like that's also I, what i've been questioning uh, myself and i think like everybody at always at our comp at our startup voices now has been thinking as well and everybody will probably give you a different answer uh, from my perspective, I would just say, don't look at the competition. Uh, just don't. Uh, I mean, I mean, like uh, the reason for it's like partially self-preservation. It's in a sense that like looking into somebody's. Um, okay, it's. I mean, it's healthy to look into a competition, like to a sense that if you want to learn something from them, like what do they do? What did what what did they do better that you or something that you could learn from them? Like it doesn't have to be like oh, cop that you copied. Yeah. the thing that the competition does but just more like oh i i could have done it this way or maybe i should have like done this procedure rather than that um so there are like valuable things that you can learn from the competition as well um or like other people for, like for example it would be like people that got into like those internship uh, internship positions but also at the same time, uh, it, it, it I'm also struggling with that to not uh, look uh, into um, into other people into uh, other people and like yeah, it, it it is really difficult not to compare yourself. That's like the I think that that's the biggest pro uh, the biggest uh, uh, trouble that I still have and probably a lot of people have is that we look we tend to compare ourselves. Um, to whether that will be to competing companies or to um, to our peers, and it's really natural. But also at the same time, you gotta have to learn where when it this is like going into like in, when it's like being productive feedback or like something that you could learn. Yeah. And then where where is it starting to get into the territory of like okay, this is not uh, this is like actually 
hurting me and not and like just putting me down. Yeah, so just to reiterate, uh, just basically yeah. try try to use the competition as a learned way to learn something from them and put a stop to it once it starts getting to self-destructive territory of like putting yourself down as well because uh, then that that's not not healthy as well um and uh yeah but also realize that like not every single competitor you have to win every single competition yeah. or sometimes the juice might not be worth the squeeze so to say uh, in some places like you might not have to be the best at everything that's also what you kind of have to uh, remember that like you um you don't and you don't need to be perfect in a, in every single sense as well which uh I've been starting slowly to realize and uh, learn. And uh, yeah, it's very important as well. And also it's sometimes with competitions like these, there are so many people and it's very difficult to qualitatively compare somebody. Um, it's usually sometimes tends to be sometimes a bit of perception. So sometimes uh, uh, if you like, let's say you're competing for investments as a startup, like yeah. you, there might be a competition, like in a sense, like, oh, they do the same thing. But how do they market? How do they approach the problem? Where do they do it? Like, even if you do the same thing, what, like, you have to find the differentiating factors and highlight and highlight them, basically, to everyone. To, like, uh, and highlight them. And it's sometimes, even if they don't like it, then be it. Not everybody, ha not, not everybody has to like your idea. Sometimes it might be that some people just simply don't understand it. Like, um, maybe I can give you a bit of an anecdote. Uh, when I was at a startup conference and there was like this event that was organized by two big VC VCs in America called Scale Ventures and I forgot the other one. But uh, I remember that there was like a startup associate, which is basically a position within a VC. Uh, like VC being that for venture capitalist firm yeah. uh, that like you analyze startups and then you like tell others like okay this might be a startup worthwhile inviting to pitch or like invest into to get a pitch from and pr possibly in get invest into so I remember I talked to one uh, to one uh, um, to one associate and uh, that associate they did not understand like the, the idea of the startup, but they're also trying to get get into it, like, uh, um, yeah, get into like, uh, or try to like simplify it so much that they, they didn't get the message. Like they were like, okay, so you are medical. What, do you have a doctor on your founding team? It's like, no, we don't. You need a doctor. How come you are a medtech startup and you don't have a doctor? It's like, by, by, but completely misunderstanding the concept yeah. that like, you, like, of course we need to consult them, but you don't necessarily have to have a doctor in order to help and, in like medical world, of of course you need the law make like you need a lawyer probably a good lawyer, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. also like uh, regu know the regulations and stuff. But um, and of course uh, in a consult with doctors and people you're gonna pr make the product for, but you don't need a medical doctor. Yeah. If you do a PhD, you will be a doctor. <laughs> if you're a science doctor. Yeah, you are a science doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I cannot uh, really help you respirate or <laughs> breathe, but uh, I... Uh, yeah, also, doctor. actually, that's, that's, that's a false statement. I won't be able to revive your computer, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I might know some general and be very specialist into, like, one small, one very niche field and know a whole lot about it and, tell, and give you this whole presentation, but... Other than that, yeah, it's not guaranteed that I'll be able to recover a computer or fix your printer. Uh, that message goes to uh, my grandma too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or anybody that thinks computer science is IT. Yeah. Sim simply IT. Yeah, okay. You talked about a lot like pitching yourself. And yeah, have you ever considered like building something yourself? Like yourself, like a project that you tried to like, sell yourself totally on your own or yeah okay so Nima if you are watching this <laughs> <laughs> no 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 just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah so right now I, I I mean I have ideas of course that what I would like to build uh, that there are some things but I don't really see it as like oh startup to startup maybe okay. it could be like a mini SaaS that I could build that could help to solve prob some problems but like I see it more that uh, like most of my time I anyways invest either into my master thesis because I'm right now doing my writing my master thesis, but also uh, into like Oasis now. And like it's to be honest, like I'm uh, I'm already like very stretched thin and like for both of those commitments and I 
really um and and i enjoy my work so i'm pretty happy to wor work on those things but uh yeah, if I ever get for like some free time, let's say I graduate, it's nice always to work on side projects, but it doesn't mean that I would like to necessarily build my own startup. And to be honest, I very much like the the, the culture that we that we managed to get at uh, my startup. Like uh, we understand each other, we are quite a small team, and we um, we like we like work hard, but also we try to um, help help each other, but also we. Uh, whenever we have some down periods, we also like uh, consult each other and like try to find like the silver lining in everything. But also we try to support support each other. But and uh, yeah, like I've been also through some uh, tough times as well. And uh, yeah, I consult. I talked with uh, the founders like Nima and Sarah, and they were like really helpful as well. And sort of like because those are very like startup founders are the, one of the most resilient people that you'll probably ever meet because they receive a lot of no's like yeah. a lot of no's and they sort of iterate and they pivot and then they like arrive at their ideas but they are also like really resilient and, stu and stubborn and you get to lear lear learn that from them as well like you sort of start to pick that up, pick that up f from them but um but when it comes to like launching my own thing um maybe i could start like a mini mini sas idea and then like try to make sales if it doesn't work then be it but for now all my work uh, all my thought is dedicated and i'm fully dedicated to oasis now okay totally makes sense yeah you mentioned that you're doing master thesis ni now and you're also working on startup what do you like more like uh, university stuff research or <laughs> working in an actual project actual like <laughs> <laughs> practical i would say <laughs> <laughs> so i would say that uh, they both have uh, some differences uh, so oh, of course there's the difference like I, I i like both like in a sense that like a university environment gives you this this thing that you can like learn about something without having the pressure of deliver of delivering yeah. i mean of, co of course there's the delivery pressure of like if there's homework assignments and then like your exams that you have to, but it's it's different than like delivering a project at a company, but also at the same time the main um, thing about universities is that you get to learn stuff, usually the fundamental stuff, which enable you to then tackle a lot of more problems that are more specialist. So you don't really, for example, learn about like oh. Um, how to use React as a framework. No, you will probably learn about like how the web started, how to use like a lot of like vanilla JavaScript and like all the other tools, CSS and HTML, and try to build everything yourself so that you try to understand how does it work in the, in the under the hood. Uh, th that's just an example from the web, from the web world. But uh, you get to learn as well, like oh, like for example, oh, how does a neuron work? How do you like get those ways? And you try to implement it yourself, and it's like an environment where you have like less pressure about like oh, um, I think to deliver something concrete, but but it's also like it's, it's a nice environment where you can test uh, test many things out, and especially computer science, you can put like a lot of theory into practice, which is really nice. Um, but also, like, I like it because, like, so computer science specifically is more, like, a very applied math, so you could say, at some points, that, like, it's, because there is, of course, a theory, and you could, you can try to apply that, and then, like, seeing it, like, work, it really, like, help, yeah. helps you. Um, but to be honest, when it comes down to it, like, if I, if I, for example, were to compare, like, if I would do a PhD, would prefer to do a PhD or to um, work in an industry. I would prefer to work in an industry. Of course, that doesn't mean that any research, I w wouldn't want to do any research whatsoever, especially with the fact that we live in a world that there's, um, like AI is kind of like the main topic and there's a lot of research going on, a lot of research papers. Like it's a really useful skill to still like, you know, be able to read and parse through a lot of information and in, through uh, academic papers and like sort of like know what's the state of the world at the moment. And uh, that's also something that, that I quite like. So it's not necessarily that I don't like the academia. It's just I don't want to work in further stages within the academia. Like it's it, it is quite nice to study and learn within the universities and gain those like fundamental skills. But at the same time, uh, in the longer term, I see myself 
working in the industry. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think most the computer science students uh, like chooses that path. Uh, yeah, I myself personally believe that industry is more applicable in a way and just, I don't know, closer to, to my heart, I can believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, what, do you like Delft? <laughs> like, do you mean the city or <laughs> the... Both already. <laughs> both. Um, so I think the city center is nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's quite beautiful. Um, like, it, it's old and has, like, a lot of history behind it. Yeah. So it's nice in that. Um, I would say that um, it's, it's, like, quite a... Um, like it's like quite a decent university. Actually, in some fields, it might be even the best. Like, especially when it comes to aerospace, like uh, aerospace and architecture, it's the best, uh, one of the best universities to um, to like do your studies in, and uh, you get like world class professionals there. Um, computer science, not so much. It's, st it's still it's okay. high quality, yeah. uh, but it's not world class, so to say. Um, but it's still like uh, you get to learn a lot of stuff within there. And I would say that like when it comes to the university, I think um, the university itself tends to like throw you into into the deep and uh, into deep waters and then like help you to like help you and then like allows you to like put yourself in a situation where you have to like sink or swim. And like you, of course, you like uh, for highly the people that are motivated will like try to swim and make something of it. And yeah. it has a lot of advantages where you like you learn stuff that you probably wouldn't learn in a regular scenario. But like also what I like about it is that you get to learn a lot of con you get to learn a lot of content in a short amount of time. Unlike, for example, in a lot of degrees that tend to happen in UK, for example, US that uh, where a lot of these co courses go for longer amount of time and they tend to um uh and and they tend to cover almost the same content but in a long a longer amount of time whereas like in delft it's kind of like yeah it's like you you're given something then you figure it out but also you have to partially uh find it uh but uh, but also you have to like teach it, uh, teach it to yourself but you also get to learn a lot so i think that like people that uh, from uh, co come from tu delft or also eindhoven i think they are quite resource resourceful and uh, sort of go get they tend to be kind of also, uh, quite often go getters and uh, um able able to to dig themselves out of problems as well okay. um but yeah one thing i must say is that there is a bit of a when it comes to the negatives i would say that there is always like that sense of a competition that we were talking about okay. that like sometimes teachers might organize some like little competitions within the class and put a massive leaderboard where you can like see everybody's students and constantly compare yourself which is like unhealthy like to be honest i think if it's like a top 10 list uh of like to a top 10 in a class of like 100 students it's a nice competition that like oh you i was like yeah. in top 10 of that class that's like oh, quite interesting but for everybody else there's like everybody has their own path they want to learn why do i need to like compare uh, compare myself to others it's more like that i want to know where i was and like yeah. where i'm at now and i think that's also partially what comes back to the sense of competition that you you want to like also focus uh, in in some sense on yourself because focusing too much on the competition or on like your peers what they've done how they've done it it's uh, sometimes can be comparing apples to oranges you don't know what these well, what these people have been doing they might have worked twice as or three times as hard or maybe they had some experience before you with something so it's a very obscure it's very obscured like it's really difficult i, I think like we're in a computer science it's like a, such a also interesting study where you can get people from like people that had literally no experience and trying to learn something people that had bef a lot of experience beforehand and they are just like trying to formalize their education in like a more formal setting uh, and like sort of stabilize it and like al and uh, um, allocate it uh, and and like sort of organize organize their knowledge uh, but yeah it's just you get su such a variety of people um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, 
But yeah, I would say so. I, will, I, will, I guess it would be that. Or another thing is, I would say that there's generally a bit of a lacking of mentorships, like in a sense of, uh, okay, you get mentorship programs where you have like, okay, in the first year you get like your higher year, a person that's like studied a bit, a little bit longer, tells you some things yeah. and also with a professor, but it usually tends to be short term and it's, and they only cover like the shallow topics, like, okay, the logistics and the practice and like sort of things, but you don't, there's not much involvement in terms of like helping each other, so to say, or it's very, you don't really, people don't really create a network to solve like help each other too much. Or, yeah. or if there is, it's like a, it's a kind of, it becomes like really a clique. And there isn't like, it's kind of like, um, because we are, I think it comes mostly from the fact that like everybody is struggling. So they want, or like struggling by, uh, to learn everything. And like they have to make out something out of what, what they learned in class, but also externally uh, from external resources. And it's really difficult. So everybody is really busy. So they don't really have time to like help you. Or it's like very limited, which sometimes can be quite stressful and uh, depressing, especially if you get like a lot of negative feedback after your work, right? Like you've done something, you were really proud of it and you get, you get thrown with like a lot of negative feedback. It can be quite... Uh, Dam damaging and I think that usually comes with the sort of a lack of in of mentorship throughout the process I would say but it also heavily depends on who do you work with or what do you work with what are your peers like but uh, but also I would say that like one of the things that I would really recommend anybody is like trying to find like-minded individuals that are willing to help as well each other but also like don't make it into a very transactional thing that like oh i help out this and this like you might not know like just because like for example one person is like really skilled developer and you are just like a complete complete beginner you might like find each other and then like that person might want to like actually help out mentoring people or, like see what it's like to be like helping other people that are yeah. less experienced than you so they might get something out of it but also like think of it in a sense that like both of you it's a relationship that both of you give something but it's not really said explicitly yeah but like also but you can also be like a community of like-minded people and just like help each other talk to each other and uh yeah, so I think that's really important, so to say. And uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I uh, went on to too many <laughs> yeah, tangents. No, and uh, like you said, that study courses here are more concentrated. Do you think that kind of affects how, like, makes it much harder for students to work on their own projects or startups, or it's like maybe it's better that you finish studies faster and then you start working full time on yeah i would say that's also yeah the good thing that you mentioned that that's kind of also a point so um so a word of caution actually i've uh, delayed my studies already so uh i did uh, so my bachelor's is like three uh, three years of study i did it in four uh and right now i'm in my third year of my master's so i should be finished should have been finished last year but also my study is going to continue into fourth year because I still need to pass one course that's going to happen in the beginning of the next okay. year, which is, uh, yeah. But, you know, the, these things happen. And, like, if you are going to do, your like, your projects or all these stuff, you some most likely probably going to have to accept the fact that you're probably going to take a bit longer. But it's, like, depends on, like, what... What do you value more? Do you value more, like, oh, that, like, you finish everything on time and you are, like, done with it? And then, like, you immediately then think, like, okay, I'll just learn everything else on my job. Or sometimes there are people that, that just, like, want to get a little bit more hands-on practice. And, and it's, like, those those two options are perfectly valid. Like, it really depends on who you are, what do you want do you want from it. But, yeah, indeed, like, very concentrated um, studies where with a lot of workload. It can be quite challenging for students, indeed, when... Um, uh, whenever you like have interest into something and try yeah. out something indeed it can be quite uh, um un unhelpful um during during like uh, if if you really want to do that but sometimes but sometimes you might have to like think of it as like a co uh, cost make a sort of a cost analysis by so sort of by doing some hours here what do i lose uh, what do i lose and what do i lose by just like not applying my myself at like 
company uh, like working for like uh, companies or projects as well um but yeah i guess it's just like everybody but uh, but also like there are people that like are not interested in to in, uh, in the industry and they just want to do acad- academic work which is also a another valid so maybe working at those companies not, might not be useful maybe they might want yeah, to yeah. like work within a lab so usually that's kind of like also that's also another thing that i realize that brings me to my mind about um university is that like usually people that tend to like do and like do everything on time they are like really high performing individuals that are very smart and like they catch everything like with a with, uh, with a uh, with a snap of a finger yeah which is uh yeah, those those individuals exist, and uh, usually the university tends to like take them on as honor students, and they work on like research projects within, um, and like th- those tend, to, but those tend to be like really academ- academic. So like if you are a really good student, but also want to work on side projects, like you can choose to do that. But at the same time, it's like yeah, like the university once you are good, they see it as oh your future is academia. That, that ca- that's kind of a bit. Uh, I would say um, not great. I would say at uh, the university, in the, at least at the technical university that I went to, which is Delft. I'm not sure how it is in Eindhoven, yeah. but uh, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like everybody has their own path, and there is no right or wrong answer. You just have to think of it yourself. Like for example, I know I knew that I'm not academically gifted completely. Like I take probably as much as an average person, or if not, even more time to learn some stuff. And I accepted, I accepted that, but I also knew that like, I want to go into the field and actually gain some experience because I know know that like myself, that if I'm gonna delay my study, I might as well just do something as well on the side rather than simply do the courses. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's actually nice to hear because I think this morning I had a, epiphany about myself also that <laughs> may, my maybe academics is not for me <laughs> and i just <laughs> need to, to focus on some other projects yeah, I, th- I think the yeah. most important thing is just understanding yourself and finding your st- like strengths and weaknesses yeah. and then like making use of it of this combination of your skills yeah and exactly like building something that you really can contribute to the world. Build communities, meet yeah. like-minded people, and as well, uh, make sure that you are in a commu- in a with people that support you. So, like, also, uh, like, it, it's a real privilege to also have some people that really, like, believe in you as well. So, like, for example, my fam- my family as well. Um, also, my lovely girlfriend. Hi, Amina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, it, it, it's really a... It's it, it it is really something that like it's it, it, it like helps you immensely as well. So like to find the right people, find the right support support groups, and also have somebody close to you to um, to so that like are so supportive. Even sometimes when it doesn't look like they are supporting you, like and like they might not show it. They sometimes they might they might be, but like, but like you know everybody's situation is different. So. But it's just always Im- important to, I guess, hang around people that, I guess, yeah, that that are that like are ambitious, but also like they are helpful, supportive, and and you like contribute, and you, but where you also contribute so, something to them, or yeah. So th- that's what I, that's what I did. So even though I wasn't as smart as I met, like I have people that I know that work in the industry, that work in like. Uh, big tech companies or they work at startups or they are still students um but yeah i know them it's very nice to always talk to them and like meet them yeah so yeah, it's cool to hear it's uh, that's really important even like you were in i would say one of the biggest companies and like hearing these words from you maybe it's inspiration for others not to like lose the motivation to if you fail to just yeah, stop doing something. Yeah, you fail, you learn, and you stand up and you do again. Yeah, everyone does that. Yeah, and make sure so to find somebody that you can talk through stuff as well, because that that's that's really a, that's kind of becomes really ther- therapeutic to talk about your fa- failures as well to somebody and don't internalize it because just for the sake of like your mental put your also put your mentals as well as a priority as well like. It, 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 
it really helps like sometimes and remember that sometimes throughout this journey you might be uh there are going to be like it's going to be up like a uh, downs like nothing yeah. and maybe a few up few ups yeah. and downs as well and just remember that that like just because you had you failed before doesn't mean that you will fail now and it's it's always a trial and error and that if you put if you do a lot of hard work you make your circumstances right you make your own luck as well a bit then great things might happen yeah. and you never know and also try to accept as many opportunities that that that, that you see talk to people as well yeah it's really important yeah. okay you're running quite out of time but yeah sure. i want to really ask a question you do a lot of stuff um, and like yeah, as we talked about earlier uh, you're doing your masters you're you're doing oasis you, you still want to do something in your free time uh yeah what is what is like uh the most perfectly productive day look for you for you like from the morning uh till till the noon like uh, like the you mean the hour by hour <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah no? hour by no. hour minute by minute a minute by <laughs> minute or second by second <laughs> uh so i think that like a productive day for me would be like that i that i've uh, s- I had a li- like a small list of things that i want to achieve or like uh, try to uh, try out something and then like have some measurable result like for example that i've implemented something or wrote tests for something and it's or something that's like me- measurable that like okay it seems to work in that case if i even if i don't complete this fully I can, like, sometimes it might be difficult because then, like, also there's the pro- thing of, like, I like to move my goalposts as well quite often. Like, oh, if I've done this, then that means that, like, I can, yeah. I need to do this, this and that. And it, it's kind of, like, more of some of a curse. But I think it's just uh, important that, like, you, you set yourself a little goals, try to work from them. And, like, even if you don't think that you've done something, you have, like, a reflection of you you reflect on it and then like try to justify as well okay given like my circumstances what did i do and like be but be honest as well but uh to yourself but i think a productive day would be uh perfectly a productive day would be that like i set out some like smaller tasks that i that i worked on or like at least two different things so like whether that would be on my thesis and at the com at my startup but also let's say that uh uh, afterwards, I was able to uh, enjoy a nice, uh, like, uh, evening. For example, whether that will be going on a, on a walk, on a date, uh, <laughs> uh, or, um, or yeah, just like, or, or just some something fun. That that I would say like it's a most perfectly uh, productive day. Like to set out set out like a small ta- small amount of tasks and then do something fun afterwards. I would say and uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I was waiting whether you're going to include like a free time, you know, <laughs> doing stuff. Before yeah, fun. I mean, sometimes I don't always get free time, but uh, this is like the perfectly uh, productive yeah. scenario, right? Yeah. Like sometimes productive you might not be, but it all feels. But sometimes yeah. productive day might might also look into like a boring day that you didn't achieve as much, but at least yeah. like you thought about you thought about you thought a lot about the problem, and you over and you had a, either a eureka pro, uh, eureka moment or you just yeah, I had like a deep, deeper thought about something and like managed to like, sep- uh, managed to uh, yeah, undig yourself from a hole that you were in. Okay, yeah. I think yeah, we're coming to finish. Do yeah. you have any big last remarks, last questions maybe for us? Uh, yeah. So, um, what motivated you to do such a podcast and such an endeavor? That's a super uh, talking super to push. people like yourself, I would say. It's a very interesting conversation, and I think uh, there's a lot of wisdom to gain from that. So, yeah. And besides wisdom, I think that the exposure, like over the internet, when you talk like in with the experts in a certain field, if you're doing an event in the university, only like, I don't know, 40 people can like listen to it, mm-hmm. actually. And yeah, if you record it, then you can like watch it and uh, you learn from it everywhere, anytime. So that's also quite convenient. And be permanently online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but yeah, but just as Paul has mentioned, like talking to these people and learning, 
I think that's yeah. the most interesting fact. Not fact, but mm. <laughs> interesting <laughs> parts <laughs> of, yeah. of doing this. Yeah. So what was the thing that, uh, I guess, I'm guessing like, what were the biggest learnings that, that you had from like the previous podcasts and also th this uh, this episode that uh, is going to... Uh, what, what Do you want to maybe we can like one person each says one thing the most? Okay, so I, I can start from the first podcast that we did uh, with uh, Deepak. Uh, it, there was, uh, he was talking about like... Uh, making life decisions and basically how it's not like clear at the moment uh, if this is a correct decision but um, and it shouldn't be uh, to be honest like yeah. it rarely is but like just uh, making the the decision in a way that moves it towards that the best path but even if a uh, small increment yeah. is like how it should be done so i think yeah that's stuck with me. Yeah, for me, yeah, it might sound cliche, but uh, just generally, like talking with you, uh, with other guests, uh, that like at the end of the day, you have to just understand yourself, what you're good at and what you're not. I think I'm repeating this myself, but then like finding that combination, finding your perfect spot somewhere. And yeah, and I think that like spending a lot of time on what you really, really want to do. Uh, is what will bring you the best results in the world. And even mm. if you fail, like failing is part of the journey. And yeah, it's exactly. It's the best yeah. part of the journey yeah. because, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's like usually what you want to overcome. And even, well, even if you're applying to like any job interviews, also make sure to like do your side projects as well and prese uh, like present them and work on something with meaning. Like don't work on something that like uh, another to-do app. <laughs> Unless if it's like a really advanced uh, to-do app. To -do app. app. <laughs> Another web app. Unless if it's like integrates AI or blockchain. <laughs> but like it, you meaningfully try to do something and you did something interesting. Uh, but yeah, just uh, always, uh, yeah, try, okay. try it out and yeah. learn. Okay, um, so this is... This is the end. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I would. It would be great if you could like arrive to the office back at yeah. Delft as well and like share it around as well. So yeah, yeah I was invited as well back to at Yes Delft as well. And uh, okay. Yeah. okay, okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks, and yeah. thank you for listening. Yes. Uh, yes. This has been Sleep on It podcast. podcast and yeah, press the subscribe button yeah. if you if you like this episode. <laughs> This will be the best, first best picture, I think so. Yeah, first picture ever.